So, you're thinking about getting a dog, and you thought to click on me first. Well, I gotta say, I'm grateful. I think that dogs might be the most needy, domesticated animal that man has ever decided to uh, team up with. And this video is basically going to sound like I'm trying to talk you out of getting a dog, which in a way I am. Um, and it's out of love. I have been around dogs almost my whole life. Um, disclaimer, I've been around dogs my whole life. I was a, a certified dog trainer, a certified dog groomer. Um, I was even a foster parent. I'm no expert. I'm not a vet. I'm not an expert. I, I still learning something new about dogs every day. So don't have this video alone be what is the deciding factor on you getting a dog. I'm probably just going to cover the basics right now because I believe if you're thinking about getting a puppy, that is an entirely different thing. I, I honestly don't recommend your first time getting a dog to have it be a puppy. There's about 20 extra steps needed if you're going to be getting one. Um, your better bet is to get an adult dog from a shelter. Uh, let's talk adoption. Definitely think adoption first. I know you've probably heard it before, and I'm just saying it again. Um, there are so many shelters out there that are filled to capacity. They have, thankfully, some no-kill shelters, but kill shelters are very much a real thing. They have to put dogs down because there's just no room for them. It's unfortunate. I mean, there was uh, Bob Barker, who hosted Price is Right, that every single day he would sign off saying, help control the pet population, have your pet spayed or neutered today, and it is still just a huge problem with um, overbreeding, overpopulation, and um, at the same time, don't, don't poop on people that get uh, a dog from a breeder. A lot of breeders out there are very reputable, and especially if you're gonna be using a dog for what it was designed for, uh, a lot of dogs we actually bred to do a job. So if you have a retriever that you're actually going to use for retrieving, I mean, it does make sense for you to go get a well-bred, uh, pure breed, you know, uh, retriever. But most of us aren't. Most of us are just having the dog for a companion. And... That's actually one of the reasons why I'm such a huge fan of mixed breeds, uh, mutts, as you were, because they usually don't have a lot of the health issues that a purebred will have. Let's let's be honest. Let's call a spade a spade. Purebred means inbred. That means that they've been bred with other of the same breed. They usually have health issues through the wazoo. Um, I was just talking about retrievers. Golden retrievers have a lot where, you know, hip dysplasia, uh, I think blindness at some point, um, often do get big lumps on them, you know, later on in life. Although some argue that might be from diet. But, um, you know, mixed usually doesn't have any of that. They usually have, you know, the best of all the worlds. Um, and they're usually the case of an accidental breeding. So that means that they weren't expected and they needed to find a home and fast. So oftentimes they didn't have the best upbringing. If, if there's a dog that you're thinking about and they show a lot of telltale signs of... Uh, you know, potential abuse. I mean, if that's something that you're willing to try and do, then bless you. I mean, we need all the help that we can get, uh, the people that know how to deal with dogs that are like that. But um, you know, your best bet is to, you know, get a well-adjusted adult dog from a shelter for your first dog. And um, then if you can deal with that, then, you know, maybe, maybe get a puppy. But um, one of the main reasons why I'm making this video is that right now we're in the middle of the pandemic or a pandemic. I don't know when you're watching this, but I'm just talking about the uh, um, COVID-19 SARS-2 virus uh, 2020. Or it's 2021 as of this recording, still in the middle of it. And I currently work at a pet store and I just see so many people coming in with quarantine pets, pandemic puppies, I've been calling them. And it, it is the worst reason for you to get a, a dog because you're home and alone and bored. And I get it, but this dog is going to grow up thinking that life is one way, a.k.a. you're home 24-7, to then if you go back to a quote-unquote normal life, now they're going to think that you're going out on a hunt without them and they're not allowed to come. And, well, that's they have to be able to be part of the hunt Otherwise, why are they in the pack? You might kick them out of the pack. It just it it'll, it'll cause separation anxiety, destructive behaviors, 
Um, so, I mean, if you listen to this and you still are deciding to get one, just keep in mind that this dog, you know, put it put it away in a kennel for, you know, hours at a time. Um, leave the house, you know, whether it's for a walk or a drive. Um, it seems cruel, but honestly, they need to know that you're not going to be able to be with them 24-7 um, because they will think that it was something that they did. Um, speaking of, when you take a dog for home for the first time, most of them, most of you guys will want to give a week to a month of a grace period before you start setting the house rules, and that is not how a dog's brain works. Again, they're going to think when you suddenly, all of a sudden, start enforcing the rules, it was because of something that they did. You're angry at them or whatever. No, you get a dog, you bring them home. Day one, the rules start. So you're going to want to do a lot of thinking and a lot of planning before you even get this dog. Um, it's really an expensive first-time purchase, not just for the dog, but for all of the uh, gear that you want to get them. Um, just off the top of my head, uh, food dish, water dish, leash, collar, bed, kennel, um, you know, possibly, you know, depending on how far out you want to go, like, you know, even some type of fencing or, um, you know, exercise pen. Um, you know, identification, microchipping is strongly encouraged, um, but... You know, that, that, that's something that, you know, again, just, you know, do a lot of research. It's going to be uh, pretty expensive initially. And, you know, I, I ended up having to go through about two to three beds before I realized, oh, okay, she can't have a bed in her kennel during the day. At night, she's more than happy to sleep on the nice, you know, um, padded bed. But if you leave her with a bed that has any kind of stuffing during the day, she will tear it to shreds in her boredom. Um, so she's not, she can't have a bed in there, unfortunately, you know, a towel at most, but she, uh, you know, and I give her plenty of stuff, uh, in there to chew on. That's just how she's built. And you know what, that's how it's going to have to work. But, uh, yeah, again, it's like every dog is going to be completely different. So here's my biggest pet peeve is that almost everybody's first experience with a dog, for whatever reason, the dog was an absolute saint. The dog was completely well behaved, never chased after squirrels, never chewed on uh, furniture, uh, never dug the stuffing out of the mattress, never, um, you know, bit the cat, like, uh, you know, would wait at the door, would never run away, you could be off leash outside, and the thing would never leave your side. That seems to be everybody's first experience with a dog, which is unfortunate because then that's the precedent that they set for every other dog to come. And they think that their current dog is a problem dog. No, no, no. You actually had a freak of nature before. Now you have a regular dog with, you know, following its regular tendencies. And you don't know what to do about it because you never had to deal with it in the previous dog. I see so many dogs um, ended up ending up not staying in their forever home just because they acted like a dog. It's, it's so, super frustrating. Um... And I think that the worst thing you can do to a dog, especially if you're just getting a cute little puppy, is, you know, having it for a few months, it gets to be an adult, it gets to be destructive, you're, you know, out thousands of dollars in furniture, and you're like, okay, I signed up for way more than I originally thought, and then you have to rehome it, and it's already bonded with you, you, you know, again, it's going to get separation anxiety, you know, issues, it's, it's just not the way to start out. So I want you to do your research, I want you to know that... Um, you can't just go to work for eight hours, leaving the dog in the kennel, and then come back and everything's fine. Like, you know, dogs do need um, five, six hours in the kennel tops. It is not recommended to lock them in a room. Um, it's not recommended to let them roam the house. It seems mean, but honestly, there's less stress involved if they have nowhere to go but just nap until you get back. And honestly, a wolf pack sleeps about 16 hours in the day. Dogs used to doing that too, but um, the maximum time you should ever have a dog without having a pee break is five to six hours tops. So ideally, if you work an eight-hour shift, you either have somebody else that lives at the house that has an alternate schedule from you um, so that the dog doesn't have, you know, ideally, you know, more than four hours in a cage at a time, or you sign somebody up to be a dog walker so that uh, at the four-hour mark, they can let the dog out, stretch its legs, go to the bathroom, uh, get some sniffs in before going back into the kennel. Um, yeah. So, a lot of dogs will, um, and again, I'm going to get into a whole training thing, but um, 
so some of the issues that you might uh, come across, uh, especially with a new dog, is going to be um, uh, loose stool, uh, whether that be from stress, from the fact that you have to switch to a new food, which if you do have to um, switch to a new food, there's a bunch of techniques that I might get into more of a deep dive later, but um, you know, ideally if you're getting a dog, they're already on a certain food, find out what it is and then get a bag so that that way you can transition them off of it, make life easier. Um, but they uh, they were built for 12 hour work days, some of these dogs. Like, so for instance, I can't stand seeing somebody with a husky puppy in the desert. So this is a dog that was bred for cold weather. This is a dog that was bred for a 12 hour work day, pulling a sled. I guarantee you that you're not gonna be able to, you know, especially when I was living in Arizona, you can basically walk the dog before uh, before the sun comes up and then uh, after the sun goes down. Um, during the summertime, anything in between is just not fair to the dog because it, it's literally burning the pads of their feet. I mean, the pavement, you know, put your hand down on there. It's like, you know, can you hold your hand on the pavement? Well, then the dog probably shouldn't be walking on it. Um, so you're not going to be able to have a husky that much exercise. So now you're going to have a destructive dog in the house. You know, they're going to be ripping stuff to shreds because they're like, I have all this energy. I need to do something. So, you know, you're not going to be able to... Um, like with a cat, just, you know, let it go do its own thing. Um, you're going to have to be very much involved in this dog's life. Um, you're going to have to try to unlearn everything that that you instinctively want to do. Um, as a human with a dog, it's usually the complete opposite. Uh, I'll just do a couple of examples. So, for instance, like I already mentioned, you know, giving them the first week off is not the way to go. Um, even just in the way that we greet dogs, like, you know, making eye contact, you know, like coming over to the top of their head, you know, the dog's nervous and it's trying to show you with its body language, but you don't speak dog body language, you know, so there's misunderstandings, the dog might nip out of fear, and now you think you have an aggressive dog, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a lot. Again, I'll get into it more, but, um, out of all the lives that you could, in, you know, um, welcome into your home, you know, whether it be a fish or a hamster, like I said, I think the dogs are the ones that are going to require the most work, the most time, um, the most expensive hospital bill, uh, vet veterinarian bills, you know, so that's something to keep in mind is like, this is not an animal that you want to have if you don't have a lot of disposable income, not just in the initial purchase, but also in just the upkeep with the food, um, heartworm medication, um, flea and tick medication, uh, you know, regular checkups of the vet bills, um, Grooming, like, you know, nail trims. Um, I'm definitely going to get into, you know, grooming tips and tricks. Uh, I, I think I'm going to have to do an entire episode on just nail trims alone. But th that's something that you really want to keep up on it. A dog ideally should not need to have a bath more than once a month. If you do um, more often than that, like, for instance, once a week, it actually will strip the oils of their skin. And it'll cause them to be stinkier. So then you think you need to bathe them more. And then that strips the oils from the skin. So then they need to be stinkier. And honestly, once you get to that point, the only way that you can really fix it is just, you know, stop washing them, have an extremely stinky dog for a little bit, and then kind of let their body reset. So um, it's usually recommended about once a month for uh, dogs. Long-haired dogs, oh my god. Like, again, your first dog I don't think should be a puppy, and your first dog I don't think should be any dog that's a long-haired dog. Um, grooming fees are pretty expensive. If you try and do it at home, it's, it's a nightmare. I was a groomer. It's not something that you just, you know, run a comb through and take a pair of scissors to. There's so much more than that. And I just can't count the number of dogs that would come into the grooming salon just completely matted. A matted dog, by the way, the hair gets all clumped together. It's not just a pain in the butt to, to comb out. It's actually hurting them. It's actually constricting the skin. It's actually um, giving them sores. Um, a, a lot of times we'll actually, you know, cut the mats out and, you know, it, it'll look like we cut the dog, and it's like, no, 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 that was, you know, or gave it razor burn or something. It's like, no, that was what was underneath there because, you know, you couldn't keep up with the maintenance. So long-haired dogs, it's it's uh, even more research, just like puppies. A good first-time dog is probably one with a uh, shorter flat coat, 
Um, and even then, you got to think if they're in the cold weather, a shorter flat coat dog is going to need to have a jacket in the wintertime. Like they they don't have wolf fur, they can't you know keep warm. Um, you know, without a little bit of extra help because we've bred them to have, you know, a short coat that doesn't retain heat and isn't waterproof or anything like that. So um, some dogs do have a waterproof coat, but you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, it, it, you're going to have to learn how to speak dog, you know, um, especially, yeah, it, that's one thing that you're going to learn with dog training, uh, which I recommend everybody do at least the basic course um, because you need to learn how to speak dog. It's so much easier for you to learn how to speak dog than for the dog to learn how to speak you. So when I'm talking dog training, I'm not talking about you just dumping the dog off for an hour, coming back and getting a puppy. No, no, no. You are the one who has to learn how to be a pet parent. Um, all of the stuff that you've probably been told in the past are completely incorrect. You don't need to be an alpha. So dogs are not dumb. Um, they know that you're a human, they're a dog. So if you have more than one dog, yeah, between the two of them, there needs to be an alpha. That's just how packs work. But you are not a dog in the pack. Think of yourself more as a benevolent leader than an alpha. You don't need to be um, harsh. In fact, I recommend um, that you get them to think that everything that you want them to do is their idea by encouraging them with treats. And it seems counterintuitive because you're just like, well, I don't want to have to bribe my dog at all times. It's like, no, 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 this is just the way that it knows how to talk. It's like, you know, food equals good, you know, obviously. Um, and... Uh, Eventually, you know, once they get into the habit of something, you can actually wean them off of, you know, doing the treats. It's just a great way to start out showing them it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, obviously they, they and when I say treats, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, um, actual treats. I mean, a lot of dogs you can actually just reward with just bites of their regular kibble, you know, their regular dry dog food. Um, yeah, it's, it's very easy to get a dog to be picky. A lot of people will be like, well, I don't want to have them on the same food their whole life. So you sw switch out foods, switch out foods, and then pretty soon the dog starts to learn how to do finicky eating. Resource guarding is its own thing. A lot of dogs, uh, you know, if, they, if they're not raised right, they might get food aggressive or resource guarding, which means that if you try and take a toy away from them, they'll growl um, and, uh, you know, potentially become, uh, you know, aggressive when it comes to that, or if, uh, you know, they think the food's being taken away from them, especially one that has been in a situation before where it was either a stray or it was a part of um, a group that, you know, the parents didn't really pay attention, and so the other dog would steal their food and they'd let them get away with it. Um, yeah, th there's so many behavioral issues you can do that even if you're not one of those a-holes out there that beats and mistreats and abuses and neglects their dog, just through sheer ignorance and through your natural instinct as a human, like I said, um, you are, are going to want to do the wrong thing, basically. Um, I think a great example of that is, you know, um, I, saw a pic I saw a picture of this uh, old guy fishing with his dog, and you assume that they've been friends for like 12 years. He has his arm around the dog, and the dog is leaning away like that. And it's just because they don't show affection the same way that we do, you know? Um, it's, they're, they're built completely different. Like, we make eye contact because it's a sign of respect that I'm paying attention to what you're saying. Whereas if you stare at a dog, they think it's an aggression. They think that you're, you know, trying to threaten them. So, you know, like I said, you're going to want to do so much research, videos, testing out, you know, dogs, taking classes, you know. I, I definitely think that you should actually figure dog training in with a required part of the dog's cost. Um, I, it, it's just it's just so helpful and important, and it's going to make so much more sense. So, look, um, you know, I had a childhood dog growing up. Uh, that dog and my dad would just butt heads, uh, you know, uh, constantly, all the time. And now, I, I used to think that, you know, it's like, why do you have to be like that? You know, if you weren't like that, then, you know, dad wouldn't have to do that. And then I became a dog trainer and I realized, oh, it's because literally everything that dad did was the wrong way to do it. And so she was getting so frustrated with dad because he was giving all the wrong lessons that no wonder she was an escape artist. No wonder um, it got to the point where if he didn't tie her, um, you know, to a, uh, you know, keep, keep her downstairs that she wouldn't go upstairs and, you know, try and poop all over the carpet. Like, if I could go back, she could have easily been one of the best behaved dogs in the world. And... Um, you know, one of the stinkiest, best-behaved dogs in the world because, by the way, um, 
I, I, I'm going to have to do a whole other deep dive in, on nutrition alone. Um, a lot of these foods that have been around for for years, I think, honestly, the older the food, the scarier it is, probably. Um, you know, some of these grocery store brands and stuff, um, you know, well, my dad and my dad's dad, my dad's dad's dad, d dog, you know, was on it. And they were fine. Were they, though? It's funny because, you know, whenever you hear of these, like, low-end store brands and you're like, you know, oh, okay, so he was on that his whole life. Well, what did he die of? Cancer. All right, well, weird. That that keeps on seeming to be a current uh, recurring theme. First of all, trying to treat a dog with cancer, is, it, it's, it's probably a vet bill that you won't be able to afford. Do look into pet insurance. Uh, a lot of them don't really work that well. But um, vet bills, unexpected vet bills, especially with dogs, are are eye-buggingly expensive. Um, this is not a cheap animal to be treated. And that's not just, that you know, with the maintenance stuff alone, like needing to get a rabies shot every one to three years is required by law in most states, uh, or all states. I, I, I don't know. I just know the ones I've lived in, you absolutely have to because rabies can be transferred to humans. It's unfortunate that it's not required for um, parvo, bordetella, and um, distemper shots to be a requirement because those only affect the dogs. But man, if you ever had to see a dog go through distemper, I, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I definitely don't think any dog deserves to have it. Um, I, I won't get too into that, but yeah, like, um, you know, uh, like, and, and heartworm, I mean, you can't just, a lot of the stuff you can't do over the counter, like heartworm, you need to have a vet see it, and it seems like it's a scam. Oh, he just wants to pay the, you know, charge the vet bill. No. Heartworm needs to be to their weight, but also they need to do a heartworm test before giving it. For some reason, heartworm medication only prevents them from getting it. If they already have it, a heartworm medication will actually make the heartworm go worse. So you would actually be making the situation worse if you didn't get the test. So don't try and... Don't don't try and do any cheap uh, runarounds when it comes to some of this stuff. A lot of the stuff they have it in place for a reason. Um, you know, I, I can go on and on, but you know, let's just say that, you know, you're gonna have to get up, put aside some extra time in your day to take the dog for uh, for a walk or run, feed him, have him go out to poop. Okay, now have him go in the kennel. Now you can actually go to your work. Okay, now who's doing the in-between, you know, the middle of the day? All right, now you come home, and then you have to, you know, let the dog out again. Um, ideally, do another walk and or training session. I usually recommend training sessions for the uh, second part of the day. Um, you know, so this isn't just some something that's going to be there to greet you when you come home and that will love you no matter what. It is, but it's so much more than that. It's, it's, it really is a big, huge responsibility that I, for your sake, for the dog's sake, for the shelter's sake, I want you to really consider what you're getting yourself into. And if I haven't scared you off, then awesome. Hopefully this is a video that you're seeing sometime in the future where you're watching one of my specific videos and you're and I mentioned, hey, if you haven't already, go check out my Intro to Dogs uh, video. But, um, you know, now that that part's over, again, I'm not trying to scare you. I, I think that um, having a dog while I was furloughed absolutely saved my mental and physical health. Uh, even when I was at my lowest, having to take her out for walks and just get some fresh air was, you know, one of the few things that kept me sane. Um, I'm probably going to live at least five to ten years longer for having been a dog owner. So, you know, it, it's one of the most rewarding things, but it definitely is also one of the most time-consuming time things. And... Uh, you know, the worry and like, uh, you know, consider the next time you go on vacation, are you going to be able to take the dog with you? You know, are you going to have to do a, uh, you know, a pet shelter? You want to research the, uh, not pet shelter, um, you know, uh, doggy daycare or whatever, you know, um, bed and biscuit, let's say. Um, you know, that, that that's, you know, something that's going to be pricey. And also a lot of them, you only can see the front office. You can't see the actual conditions the dogs are in. So do your research if you're ever going to be doing, you know, uh, vacation stuff. And again, that's something I might dive into deeper uh, later on. But I just uh, realized I hadn't talked to you even about, well, what are you going to do when you leave? You know, what if you want to have a life outside of being a dog owner? A lot of places, uh, hotels, um, you know, don't take dogs. Um, 
As far as it goes right now, the standards for having a dog in an airplane are atrocious. I don't think I'd recommend it unless it's a dog small enough that you can use as a carry-on. The ones that have to go into a kennel in the belly of the plane, um, it's a nightmare. Look it up. It's, it, it's, it's sick that they still don't have much quality control when it comes to that kind of thing. So uh, a trip that you might have been able to do previously on a plane, you might either have to leave the dog at home or now that two-hour, you know, flight is going to be a, you know, four-day road trip now. Um, you know, so a lot of things to consider with a dog. But if uh, I haven't scared you away and you're still here at the end of it, then uh, I'm glad that you at least took the time to listen to some of the problems you're going to run into. Because, again, uh, so many people just impulse buy a puppy. Yeah, it's exciting, but I know so many of those dogs are the ones that are now an adult in a shelter. Um, you know, forget it if it's any kind of pit or pit mix. They're still such a ridiculous, for whatever reason, I am going to do a completely separate episode on just pit bulls in general, which, by the way, is not a breed. I think you might be thinking of American Strapshire Terrier. But anyway, um, any, anything that looks like it has any pity, uh, any pity in it is just one of the hardest to adopt out. So, and, and, and it stinks because their reputation is so undeserved. They usually make the best family pets. Um, that's technically one of the things they were bred for. And so... Um, you know, shout out to pit bulls, one of my favorite species, uh, not species, one of my favorite, uh, breeds of dog. I don't care if I lost some of you on that one. Um, that's, you know, just how I feel. But again, thanks for listening. I'm going to try and do, uh, a deep dive about dogs each week, getting into specific things. Like I said, I might just do an entire episode on nail trims alone. Um, believe me that I, I could probably talk for, you know, a half hour on just nail trims, but you know, there's a lot to it, so, you know, definitely uh, think before you buy, but, um, you know, if you do it right, you'll never regret it, <laughs> and if uh, you do it wrong, I'm coming for you, no, I, I'd never be able to figure out, uh, and this every way with the trying to find the button awkwardly while I mention it out loud, because I'm not going to edit